This is On the Line, and I'm Eric Felton. China's high-flying economy is coming back to Earth, and economists are wondering how hard the landing is going to be. Imports are down in China, and economic growth is slowing. Last weekend, Chinese President Hu Jintao said that the country's economy was at risk from a, quote, lack of balance, coordination, and sustainability. He said the government would step in to boost domestic demand and bolster growth. What options does China have to spur its economy? And what happens in China and beyond if the Chinese economy stumbles? I'll ask my guests. Pedro da Costa, economics correspondent for the Reuters News Service. And joining us from our studio in New York City, Gordon Chang, journalist and author of the book, The Coming Collapse of China. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Pedro, people are talking about uh, growth numbers in the 7% range for, for China. For most places in the world, that would be considered fantastic news, um, but it's not considered fantastic news in, in, in China. Um, why is that? Well, you have to keep the number in perspective, and especially in, in demographic perspective. Uh, and we, of course, get accustomed to rates of growth in the 2 to 3 percent range here as being something we're comfortable and something that's decent. But in China, in order to just keep up with new entrants into the labor force, both from population growth and from rural inhabitants going into the cities, it, you know, it's estimated that China has to grow at at least a 5 to 6 percent rate just to, to tread water. So really, a 7 percent growth rate is, is not spectacular for China. Gordon Chang, what's your sense of, of where the Chinese economy at this point is? What, what are the signs that you're seeing that economists are looking at that things are not going as well as they have been in China? The economy is flatlined. By far the most reliable indicator of Chinese economic activity is the production of electricity. And in the second and third quarters of this year, the growth of electricity averaged less than 1.5 percent. And because electricity growth historically outpaces the growth of gross domestic product, we're talking an economy that's not growing at 7, it's not even growing at 3. I think that it's about 0 maybe negative one, maybe plus one. But when you look at the other factors, such as falling imports, um, the manufacturing surveys, which really have been quite disastrous for the last 10 months, and price indices, you see an economy that essentially has flatlined. So those numbers that Beijing is coming up with, I don't think that they bear any correlation with reality. Well, Pedro, what, what do you think about that? Um, you know, when, when people look at some of the anecdotal evidence, the New York Times has done a number of um, uh, pieces where they've gone and looked just a, around the country in China at what's going on. They find things, for example, a, a recent New York Times headline, China confronts mounting piles of unsold goods. If you go to um, wholesalers, you'll find that the factories are still cranking out lots of goods, but they're piling up in sure. wholesalers' warehouses. Well, to Gordon's point, I think the, the issue here is the downside of lack of transparency. When people can't trust your economic data, it leaves a lot of room for debate as to what it actually is. And the Dallas Fed recently had a report that was surprising because even though it's sort of discussed in economic circles that there are doubts and concerns about the, the validity of, of some of its Chinese economic data. It was, it was interesting to see the, the Dallas Federal Reserve come out with a study casting doubt. Um, and, and what kind of doubt did the Federal Reserve out of Dallas cast? Well, they were just, they were just questioning some of, the, some of the numbers in the same way, not, not as drastically as Gordon, perhaps, but just, just casting doubt on the reliability of some of the real-time indicators without making a judgment as to whether it was stronger or, 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 or slower. Uh, but, but in terms of the signs of weakness, they've been definitely prevalent. Even the data, you know, if you take the data at face value, there's a significant slowdown. You had six straight quarters of slowing growth. Uh, you're expected to have a seventh one coming up. The government is expected to fall short, even by official statistics, of its 7.5% uh, growth rate target for this year. So, you know, and manufacturing activity, for instance, is at its slowest pace right now since 2009. You recall 2009, we essentially had a collapse in global trade following the 2008 financial crisis. So, you know, the, the parameters for comparison is certainly getting pretty ugly. Well, Gordon, um, President Hu Jintao at an APEC summit said that uh, the Chinese government will boost domestic demand and maintain steady and robust growth as well as basic price stability, he said. Um, is the Chinese government able to do those things? 
Well, you know, everyone has assumed that they were able, and I thought that they were able. But if you look at what they have done since last November, um, they have uh, monetary easing, um, three uh, drops in the reserve requirement ratio, two interest rate decreases, and a lot of announcements of building of projects. You know, in May, when there were all of those announcements from the National Development and Reform Commission of all these projects that have been approved, people were saying that the recovery would show up in July. Well, it didn't show up in July. July's numbers were really disappointing, and the August numbers, which we have just seen, confirm the trend. So I'm not so sure that stimulus is going to work in the same ways. They may be able to engineer a little bit of growth, but it isn't going to last very long. And part of the problem is what you were just talking about, and that is they've already got these uh, mountains of inventory which they haven't sold. You know, creating unsold inventory is technically GDP, but eventually it catches up with them. They've just got too much debt in China right now, and they don't really have that ability to sort of put money in and create growth like they did in the past. You know, they were able to do it in 2008, 2009, 2010, but I don't think that they can do that now. Okay. Pedro. Well, I think one of the reasons for that is that in 2008 and 2009, 2009 especially, the world was just about to emerge from recession and growth was picking up again in the rest of the world. You have a Chinese economic model that is heavily export dependent, as we've all come to know. And so with Europe in the mud and the U.S. economy slowing down, there are fewer and fewer places for China to export to. So I think that's one of the issues. You can stimulate, stimulate domestic demand all you want, but if you're an export-based economy, then you can only go so far with that. And Gordon, there also seems to be issue of, of whether further um, stimulus efforts could contribute to inflation in China. And, and to what extent is the risk of inflation also become a political liability in China? Well, the consumer price number that came out for August, which was up 2.0 percent, was actually quite low in comparison to what they had about a year ago. Um, and if you look at producer price index, that was down 3.5 percent. So they've got some room there to, to sort of stimulate things. But the problem is, you know, everyone looked at that M2 number, uh, money supply, the broadest gauge of money supply, and it was disappointing. And I think part of the reason why was capital flight. So they can put money into the Chinese economy, but the Chinese people and Chinese enterprises are taking it out. And we saw that in the second quarter of the year with the balance of payments tur turning negative for the first time since 1998. You know, we're starting to see the foreign reserves come off a little bit. Um, this really means that the ability of the Chinese government to do what it wants is really declining. And yeah, inflation does give them some room, but I don't know how much. They're really looking at not so much the CPI number, but housing prices. And housing prices haven't come down and are still a political issue for the government. And Pedro, what are the risks to the global economy from the issues that China is having and the question of whether they're able to sort of keep the economy humming along or whether it stumbles? Uh, it's, it's a very, it has very important implications for the whole world. China surpassed Japan as the world's second largest economy in 2010. The GDP of China is about seven and a half trillion dollars, which is about half of the United States. So it's, it's really enormous and I think it speaks to the importance of, uh, the growing importance of China that the Fed has actually flagged the country by name, specifically in the in the minutes of its. This is uh, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. who are economic policymakers. Exactly, the the U.S. central bank is literally flagging Chinese growth as a risk to the U.S. economy explicitly. So, it's the first time that I can remember that they've that they've specifically named a country that way. So, and Gordon, Eric, could I disagree a little bit? Sure, go ahead. You know, everyone talks about China as the engine of global economy, but it's not. Because to be an engine of the global economy, you got to take the exports of other nations. And China has been running these very large trade surpluses. So the U.S., for all of our problems, is still the engine of global growth, which shows you how bad the world is, in sh how bad shape the world is in. You know, China has uh, really, through predatory policies, um, taken manufacturing from other countries and located it into China. And also, so domestic demand in China, um, while it's growing, is not as big as most people think. You know, consumption plays a, rel a very small role in the Chinese economy, maybe 35 percent, 36 percent of GDP, the lowest in the world. So, you know, China could fall apart, and I'm not so sure it would have that much of an effect. Yeah, we would all be shocked, 
I mean, uh, the markets would have a bad time for about a week. But when we realize the effect of this, I'm not so sure. You know, manufacturing in China, if it disappears, it's going to go to Vietnam, it's going to go to Mexico, and some of it's going to come back to Nebraska. So I'm not so sure that we're going to see a real problem in the world when China falls apart. And China will fall apart. What's your sense on that, Pedro? I mean, I tend to disagree, if only because you mentioned the, the markets. And for better or for worse, I'm not saying markets should rule the world, but these days markets are very influential to the direction of sentiment in the global economy. And it's very difficult to see a Chinese collapse in an environment where the rest of the world is already barely treading water that wouldn't kind of tilt sentiment in the other direction and lead to the kinds of retrenchment, retrenchment in spending. Even if it is only psychological, that would, would send us into another recession. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today on that. And uh, Pedro da Costa is economics correspondent for the Reuters News Service. And Gordon Chang, journalist and author of the book, The Coming Collapse of China. Thanks for joining us.